Hey, here's Scott. Hey. <laughs> Where's the nurses, man? We need some oxygen for this guy, man. He can't think. He did one jog across stage, and that guy can't think now. Oh, two, you're right. That was, that, that was the slowest wave I've ever seen in my life. It was great. It was like in slow motion. If you guys could have seen it, it was really, really awesome. I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. Sam, you did a great job. Um, yeah. I've gotten winded just hitting the stairs, so I'm glad you made that and were able to do your thing. <laughs> hey, good evening. I'm Scott. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I'm in recovery from sex addiction and compulsive overeating. Hey, but real quick business before I get started. In the ladies' restroom was a phone that got left behind, so if you're missing a phone and you happen to go to the restroom tonight, in the late, there we go, we got one. No, no, she's going to the back. <laughs> you faked me out, man. I thought it was yours. <laughs> but I have it. It'll be back there, the back room right there. We got, we got somebody. They're going to come up and grab it. Christine, will you hand this to her? Awesome. Thank you very much. Awesome. So we just want to make sure you get your property back. I've preached before and left my sunglasses, and then I came down from preaching, and I didn't have sunglasses anymore. So uh, we do take that serious. We want to give people. So if you stole my sunglasses, we're talking about fourth step stuff tonight. And uh, when we get to the men's lesson, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding, I'm messing with you. But uh, uh, we are talking about spiritual inventory tonight, and I used an analogy uh, a couple weeks ago regarding a refrigerator. And I used the analogy of that refrigerator, and you got to know what's stock in there. I'm a guy, and so a lot of times I got the doors wide open, we've got the double door thing going, and I'm just like looking. Hey, babe, where's the salami? I don't see it. And she goes, there. And I'm like, hey, where's the cheese? It's there. And I don't see it. And she goes, if you move that bottle right in the front, it'll be right behind that. And then I move the bottle and I find it. And that's awesome because she has a great idea of what's in the refrigerator. I don't. Um, I don't have a good idea. I don't have a good inventory. But I do know this, if I wait too long <coughs> to eat the food in the refrigerator, it gets moldy. I've been in there and I've seen those vegetables when they've been in that plastic bag a little too long and they start to get a liquid in there. Mmm, delicious, delicious. But tonight we're going to talk about, um, hold on just a second, I apologize. <coughs> there we go. All right, I had to cough, man. I always have to cough. Why do I do that? It is what it is. But we, uh, two weeks ago, went through the columns, and so let's put the columns up there. And in this, this is what Beatrice went through. She walked you through the person, the <coughs> whoever it is you got that resentment against or that you hurt, and then you've got the cause, the event, what actually happened. Not your figment of your imagination, not, hey, they did this and everything that you made up about the event, but literally what specifically happened about the event. You write that down, and then you get to the effect. How did I feel? How did all this stuff happen, right? We got the uh, vocabulary, the feelings vocabulary sheet that has like 900 feelings, and I'm like, I had two. <laughs> well, maybe three. I had happy, I had angry, and I had sad. That was about it. And, uh, but now there's like 900 other ones that I didn't know. And so I have to educate myself on that. And then you get to the other column about what, how did this damage me? Socially, sexually, right? Or my security. And then the last part, which I always hate, is my part. What did I do in this process? And so that's kind of what we're talking about right now. And so if you go through the step study you get to this part, and everything that I talk about tonight, you would take the information, the names, all that stuff, and you'd plug them back through this inventory sheet. Does that make sense? Hope so. Well, I want to start with this. Psalm chapter 139, the, it is a great chapter, verses 23 and 24, and this is what it says. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is anything offensive, any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, O oh God. 
in your recovery, do you sit down ever and go, search me, oh God? Not, hey, God, help me. Not, hey, God, uh, free me from this. Not, hey, God, uh, get me out of this bind I'm in. But do you ever sit down and go, search me, oh God? Search me and know my heart. Whew, I hope you do. I hope you get to a place where you can do that. And know all of our thoughts, because I got a lot of thoughts that are gnarly. And it's scary what rattles around in this brain. Well, the first column or category I want to talk about tonight is relationships with others. First area that we're going to talk about and going through this fourth step is our relationship with other people. That's basically everybody you've ever known. That's a lot of people. That is a lot of people. Well, they've come up with a few things for you, but I want to read Matthew chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. And this is out of the Lord's Prayer. So if you're familiar with the Lord's Prayer, maybe you've said it before. Um, halfway through it, it says this, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What a great passage of Scripture. That we would actually know these things. And we have to, in order to forgive, we have to know the hurt we've received. Right? And in order to ask for forgiveness or seek forgiveness or seek amends, we have to know what we've done to other people. Hence, inventory. Well, first question, and there's a list of seven questions up here. Who has hurt you? For some of you, you sit down and you're like, this is my jam. Because why? Because we have been victims a lot of our life. And we love to sit down and we love to write out how everybody else in this world has hurt us. I get that. I remember a moment in time on, uh, I had a job. And I remember getting called into an office with a bunch of other leadership at this job. So it was a senior leadership team at this uh, place. And I was in this room, and there were six guys in there, and there was one main guy. And I remember walking into this room, and I remember he started this conversation, and he goes, hey, Scott, I just want you to know you're fat. <laughs> wow, the great way to start the meeting. That's really awesome. And I want you to know you're fat and you're overweight, but I think that we need to help everybody that's dealing with this. And I called you in to tell you you're fat. Why? Because... I think you can get thin and you can help other people. And I was like, I'm going to punch you right in my face, in your face, but if I do, guess what? I'm going to get fired, so I'm probably going to just sit here. So I sat and listened, and he continued to talk. And then not only did he say that, he goes, but there's a lot of other people on this campus that are fat as well, and I want you to go to them and talk to them and get them to get help. Exactly. So when you start, yeah, I know. That's what I was saying. What the heck? What is going on? I remember this meeting, and I walked out of that meeting. I told them a little thing or two. I said, hey, no way am I ever going to do this. Do you understand how offensive this is, how hurtful this is? And I walked out, and I had a 30-minute drive to a dentist appointment, and I cried the whole way there. I called my wife because I didn't know what else to do. And she was a huge blessing to me. And that was huge. More recently, I've been in a meeting, and I've been telling truth, and I've been sharing something with a guy, saying, hey, these are the things that have happened. Boom, 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 boom. I've seen them. I've witnessed them. I have witnesses that will say these things happen. And then what has been responded is, no, you're a liar. That didn't happen. Wait, wait, I got witnesses that will say this happened. Nope, that didn't happen. I've been told I'm a liar. I was a witness to a kid that was standing in his on a field and his coach came up to him because he wasn't doing the things he was supposed to do and he was told, you're worthless, get off my field. Yes. Have you remember those moments? Have you ever been told that you're worthless? These are the things that I'm talking about when you say, have you been hurt before? I don't say that to get sympathy. I don't say those stories to get you angry and upset with me to get people on my side. I share those stories because you probably have similar stories in your own life where there's been hurt and pain that has been deep and wounding to you. 
And we need to get help. And we need to put them up through the columns. And we need to go through them because otherwise, what is it going to do? It's going to lead us to using again. The second question is this. Whom are you holding a grudge against? Well, I'm going to pass that one along, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, I am going to stick on this for a moment. Um, and that, I struggled with this question as I was preparing for this message. I had lunch with a guy, uh, one of my sponsees today, and I was just honest with him. I was like, I might be holding a grudge. I might be seeking revenge. I might be really, I'm really struggling with this right now. Because there is a situation that because I have taken a stance on a certain thing, I'm not able to do something that I love. And it affects not only me, but it affects my children, it affects my wife, it affects my family. And I really am struggling with letting it go. And I remember this last week, my wife was like, you have to let it go. And I literally said, I don't think I can. I know I'm the recovery guy, and I know I got all the tools, and I know I'm supposed to because I'm supposed to do that because I get a paycheck to be the recovery guy, but I don't think I can right now. And so guess what? I meet with my sponsor. I meet with my accountability partners tomorrow at breakfast, and I'm going to continue to go through this and inventory it and go through it and go through it. Whom are you seeking revenge against? Who do you see and you go, I just wish I could, right? I remember watching a movie recently and there was this guy that just walked in and he just walked up and slashed a dude's tire and then went in and talked to him and then left. And I was like, what just happened? Oh, he slashed his tires. Yeah. You know, the people that you're actively seeking to punish them, maybe it's your spouse and you actively seek to punish them through not talking. Well, I'm being kind. I'm not sharing evil things to him. Yeah, you're right, but you can still cut that silent treatment with a knife. It's still tension, and we still try to get back at people like that. Are you jealous of somebody? I was jealous of this guy named Ryan Baldwin that I went to high school with. He was an amazing athlete, and his dad was a pitcher in the, um, in, for the Mets, and this dude had all the talent in the world. And he squandered it, and he was like, and I just wished I had one ounce of that talent. It was rough. Who have you hurt? I can sit up here right now, and I've hurt my family, I know. My addiction to pornography, the lie I believed is it's not hurting anybody at all. But the reality, when my wife found out, and I got exposed, and I got it got revealed, I realized I have hurt and I have damaged my wife. That I'm still 20 years later trying to work through some of that hurt and pain and scar tissue that we have. Who have you been critical of or gossiped about? Well, I'm a football coach. I'm supposed to be critical of people, right? I, critical, I, I criticize what they do. I watch what they do. I do. I get on them. But when your criticism goes from what they do to who they are as a person and starts to attack that, wow. We need to really look into that. Who have we gossiped about? Who have we shared things that we should not have shared with? And I'll be honest, man, I, I've, I've done that recently. I've shared some stuff I shouldn't have shared regarding the situation I'm struggling with because I just am so desperate to have somebody listen to me that I will compromise sometimes. And I'm working on it. I'm working on it. How have you tried to justify your bad attitude by saying it's their fault? You know, if you wouldn't do this, then I wouldn't have to do that. Or if you did this, then I wouldn't have to do that, right? Those things, if you wouldn't tick me off, I wouldn't have to leave and go sit in the bar. Hmm. Hosea 4 verse 4 says this, but don't look for someone to blame. Pretty straightforward, simple. Man, I got to cruise through this. I'm sorry, guys. Priorities in your life is the next category. Priorities in your life. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it flashed up there a second ago, but it says this, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. 
as well as Matthew 6, 21, where it says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The things that we invest in, the things that we focus on, those are the things, that's where our treasure is. So when you're putting all your time and all your energy into that drug, into that alcohol, into that relationship that's, uh, that your wife doesn't know about, when you start doing those things, the hurt and pain, that's where you, is, is there. It's really showing your mo- motives. So here's the questions that are lined up. What areas aren't you putting God first in? You know, your selfish behavior. I remember Brian Regan. You remember Brian Regan, the comedian? Love that dude. Hilarious. He's got a bit where he talks about the me monster. Where he goes to a party and there's that guy that all he does is start talking. Me, 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 Right? And so many times we are all about ourselves. We're in a relationship and we say we love this person, yet everything about this relationship is all me, 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 me. What can they do for me? Instead of how can I love and serve them? Couples come in for counseling. Couples come in because they're going to get married And this is the biggest thing to convey is, man, you have to love and respect your partner. But so many times, me comes first and just destroys it. What about your hobbies? You have hobbies that are getting in the way? I love football and I love fantasy football and it was getting in the way of stuff. And I had to quit watching football for a while. I had to give up cable TV. I mean, I scheduled my time to go to church on Saturday nights. So Sunday morning, I know I'm a pastor, but still, I, was, I only had to go to one service. So I went Saturday nights. Sunday morning, I'd wake up, I'd watch YooHoo, you, Yahoo, YooHoo, <laughs> YooHoo's the drink, Yahoo's the website. I'd watch Yahoo, and I would get the information regarding all my fantasy picks, and all I had to do is shift my guys around and last-minute decisions. And I did great. I was first, second, third place for a couple years running. And then there was some financial stuff, and I had to make a decision. Do I continue down this path, or do I say, hey, let's cut cable, and let's cut this stuff so that way I can change maybe my priorities? What from your past is interfering with you doing God's will? And that's going to be your focus question tonight. Your ambitions, your pleasures... Is there a secret you're holding on to that nobody knows? You know that thing that you told, I'm going to take this to my grave and I'm not going to tell anybody else? Question three, what have been your priorities in your your job, friends, and goals? What's been your priorities? I had a priority of going and having Raider tickets for the longest time. (laughs) Had season tickets. I was down by the black hole. I wasn't in the black hole because I couldn't afford that yet. But I was by the black hole. I could see all the craziness and be awesome. You know, during Christmas time, they had the Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Raider Claws that were, they were right across the aisle from me. I was there. I was in it. <laughs> in it. It was awesome. And all the while, putting my family more and more in debt. Where was my priorities? Was it getting that feeling of going to a Raider game or going to a football game? Tough stuff. Who do you put? Uh, who did your priorities affect? They affect somebody. I know my priorities affected my family, those around me. What was good about your priorities? What was wrong with them? The next category is your attitude. Man, I got to cruise. Your attitude. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. That is a lot of stuff that I'm like, God, couldn't you just say it different? Can't you just keep it vague? Why do you got to be so stinking specific? Mm. But he lays it out. First question that comes up is this. Do you have an attitude of gratitude? Attitude of gratitude. Or do you find yourself always complaining about your circumstances? Let me say one word and see what it triggers in you. Work. (laughs) Yeah. Do you work with a joyful heart? Are you the guy that's like, woohoo, I love this, this is great. Or are you the person like, oh man, I got to do this again, man. 
I struggle sometimes. Sometimes I don't have the best attitude. Sometimes I do have a good attitude. What about with your family? You know, hol- uh, holidays are going to come up again. And you got to go to Thanksgiving. And you don't want to go to that person's house. But you're going to be there. Whew. Are you going to grumble and complain? Do everything without grumbling or complaining. I hate that passage of scripture, but it is something I got to apply to my life. In what areas of your life are you ungrateful? Question three, have you gotten angry and easily blown up at people? Mm. Yeah. All it takes is one person to cut me off. I get ticked. But what's great is somebody put on the back of my truck (laughs) faith over fear. And so now I'm like, I can't do anything. They're going to know I'm a Christian and I can't do anything. So just smile at them. It's really, really, I struggle. I still may call them in my kids' terms. I may call them a Nimrod. But I don't act out. I don't blow up. Some people hate when we get lied to. I don't like being lied to. I don't like being told that I'm something that I'm not. Sometimes I would use my anger and I'd blow up at people simply to deflect and get them away from me. In my addiction, I would use and then I would go home and I would be fearful of that relationship. So in sex addiction, there's a flip side of the coin from sex addiction to sexual anorexia. And I would flip from sex addict to a sexual anorexia and all of a sudden, my wife would try to talk or whatever, and I'd explode, get ticked off, be angry, and push them all away. <laughs> Whew. Yet the damage I did. Have you, have you been sarcastic? You know what sarcasm is, right? No. It's the tearing of... Yeah, exactly, right? Exactly. I have been called on this so much, and I will even try to say and say, and be supportive, and say something, and my wife will go, you're saying the right words, but your tone is totally wrong. And I'm like, no, baby, I really mean it. (laughs) Right? I just said I totally mean it. What in the world? Why didn't you get that? I really struggle with that, but yet I'm trying to really mean it. What in your past is still causing you fear or anxiety? You know, the thing that keeps you awake at night, You lay your head down on the pillow, and it creeps up. I did a lot of damage to my brain because of my addiction. And there's times that uh, I struggle when I sleep. I got no control over it, but there's images, there's things, there's dreams. I got no control of that stuff. And there's times it just freaks me out, man. So those things we put on our list. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John says this, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. But one who fears is not made perfect in love. Yeah, I'm not going to go there. I don't want people ticked off at me, so I'm going to stop there on that. Okay. Um, Your integrity is the next category, your integrity. This is a tough one because we're addicts. And I'm going to make a very general statement that probably may or may not apply to you, but as addicts, we're liars. I know. All of you that are in the room that are codependents, you all know that we're liars. And that's what hurts you and causes pain in your life, is the fact that we lie. Colossians 3, 9 says this, Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. We would stop lying. This is a rigorously honest program. And that's tough to do. First question is this, In what past dealings were you dishonest? One of my biggest things is I may not outright bold-faced lie, but I just straight outright half-truth. 
right? I share just enough, but not enough, so I get in trouble, right? So how much do I have to share so that they stop questioning me, but not enough so I get in the ultimate trouble? All the codependents right now are ticked off. (laughs) I'm so sorry. But that is so true in our lives, and I try to get better. I got caught in one of these the other day, and I was like, oh, no. I thought I was getting better, but I'm not. I got to make amends. I got to go and do my stuff. That's a good thing we're only on step four, but when we get to steps eight and nine, we'll learn how all that plays out. How about this? Have you stolen anything? Paper clips, pens, Right? You're in the grocery store at O'Brien's or wherever you're at, and you're going through that one bin, and all of a sudden you see the candy there, and you're like, hey, there's free samples. (laughs) This ain't Costco, man, no. (laughs) Have you taken things? How about when you're in your addiction and you were uh, employed and you did your stuff when you were at work? What about the time you stole? Mm. Money, whatever it may be. Question three, have you exaggerated to make yourself look better? (laughs) Yes. I'm a storyteller. I love humor. The way I do humor is through storytelling. The bigger, the more outrageous of the story, the better it is. But am I being truthful in it? I tell a story of me jumping a levee. When I was 16, I had my license play, or my license for uh, a week, and I jumped a levee out in the orchard, out on the end, of, at the end of Hart Road, way the heck out there in the country. And I'm always like, he was like Duke's the hazard. And I put it, I was like, neat, 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 neat. I paused in the middle. It was like these boys are in trouble. I tell that right. <laughs> that didn't happen. I simply hit a levee going 60 miles an hour and landed in an orchard. I don't know what happened. There was dust everywhere. I couldn't see anything. I just knew I was in deep doo-doo with my parents if they found out. Never fix the alignment on that car. Could never figure that out. I did eventually make amends when I was 25, 26, but the car was gone. But um, did make amends for that. In what areas of your past have you used false humility? And a lot of people are like, well, what's false humility? I get it. What about when you're fishing for compliments? Oh, no, you know, it really was nothing. It was nothing. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't that bad. What about when we are deflecting praise? Someone comes up and says, hey, you did a great job. Oh, no, no, it's... Druff. You know, they, they, they praise our kids because they're well-behaved. And, um, and we deflect, oh, no, they should, they should always do that. Yeah, yeah. And we deflect. What about those that uh, have false humility because, and, and this is how it plays out, is they, they play helpless. Oh, I have no power. Woe is me. I play the victim. Work is really tough. Yes. I know. That's why they call it work. <laughs> Guess what happened in Genesis? There was sin, and that was man's curse. I'm sorry, you got to deal with it. Work is tough. Or self-deprecating humor. I used to struggle with this a lot. I was good for laughs. I wanted laughs. And I remember my beginning times of preaching, I would use humor to just jack me up. And everyone would laugh. And they're like, oh, Scott, you're so funny. And all that kind of stuff. And I'd get home. My wife was like, I hate it when you do that. Yeah. I know. Question five says this. Have you lived one way in front of your Christian friends and another way at home or at work? Hmm. Great question. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. 
So I'm going to take a moment. I just went through four categories, a lot of questions, and I just brought up my own hurt and heartache, and that may have triggered you, and you may be in a place that you're going, holy cow, why did I even come tonight? Go to that passage of Scripture and realize this truth, that though our sins are like scarlet, we have many. He makes them white as wool. He heals us, he cleanses us, and all that kind of stuff. And we have to do this work so that we can be healed on the inside. This is what God uses to help us heal. So that way it doesn't keep hanging out with us until we're 90 years old and still stuck on the same thing. You know, one time when I was... No, we won't be doing that. But we will be standing firm on the truth that God has forgiven us. We are forgiven and clean. And if we continue recovery, we will make amends and all our relationships and the friends of my buddy, they'll be flat. You guys stand and we'll close our time with the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you in our next. Amen, amen. I know that was like an emergency break thing at the end, and I know we we're running out of time, but take that truth tonight. Apply it. Go to your focus questions and uh, what from your past has or is keeping you from following God's will for your life. Have a great night. We'll see you guys at dessert.